Hello and welcome to Jive Talking. This is the live stream for patrons only. Thank you for joining. It's a really beautiful day here in England. Uh, have a lovely morning, just enjoying some sunshine and uh, the river. And now I'm going to have a good stream and a good chat uh, with my friend and co-host for the day, Redbeard. Hello. Um, and we're going to be talking today about interpreting mythology and what that really means, um, like how in the last, well, basically starting in the Victorian times, methods for interpreting mythology were proposed and different schools have uh, arisen within, uh, within this field of comparative mythology and the study of mythology in general. And which ones, uh, what, which, what the benefits of different schools are, what, what kind of scholars are involved and what angles they approach, uh, they approach this topic from and what I agree with from each different school and what I don't and uh, where I think the pitfalls are and uh, where we think they are. So I think I'll start with a caveat that I don't believe that any person who uh, studies comparative mythology and approaches the topic of mythology as a subject, not one mythology, but human mythologies as a subject, can ever really be said to be uh, possess the entire truth of the topic because the revelations and in, of due from interpretations of mythology aren't necessarily uh, mutually exclusive, uh, and I think often they are aren't always entirely universal. So you may have someone might discover a very important theory that encompasses a great many different myths, but not all of them, and also. Uh, their theory doesn't negate the relevance or necessarily uh, negate the relevance and uh, truth of uh, competing theories. So now that I've said that, we should start uh, maybe with um, the beginning of, uh, start at the beginning. I'd say the, um, we could start with the basics of what Wikipedia defines as the two main schools of, um, of comparative mythology, of, mytho of, of mythological studies. And it divides them into the following. Uh, substantive, or, yeah, I got it, you got up in front of you. Uh, substantive or essentialist theories that focus on the contents of religions and the meaning the contents have for people. This approach asserts that people have faith because beliefs make sense insofar as they hold value and are comprehensible. The theories by Tyler and Fraser focusing on the explanatory value of religion for its adherents. That's quite a, you know, a materialist uh, view. Uh, Fraser was an atheist. Uh, then by Rudolf Otto focusing on the importance of religious experience, more specifically mm. experiences that are both fascinating and terrifying. And by Mercia Iliad uh, focusing on the longing for otherworldly perfection, the quest for meaning and the search for patterns in mythology in various mm. religions. These are all offer examples of substantive theories, but within that substantive classification, there's huge differences, and I uh, uh, will will discuss those uh, in more detail. The other school is functional, which we won't discuss in as much detail. Uh, it's it says in the Wikipedia uh, a stronger form reductionist theories. It, functional can also be called reductionist, and they focus on the social or psychological functions that a religion has for a group or a person in simple terms. The functional approach sees religion as performing certain functions for society. Theories by Karl Marx, the role of religion in capitalist and pre-capitalist societies, Sigmund Freud, psychological origin of religious beliefs, Emile Durkheim, social functions of religions, and the theory by Stark and Bainbridge exemplify the functional theories. These are obviously entirely materialist and uh, of very little actual value if you understand or look at the real reasons that people create mythologies or mythologies grow out of, if, and with cultures in the first place. They're not uh, merely functional and uh, they're not systems of control, as Marx said. Um, so, uh, and, and that, you know, they are really a way of uh, interacting or understanding the divine. And some of the materialist uh, theorists, such as Campbell, actually recognize that. And uh, that's important to recognize too. So, uh, some of the materialist theorists of mythology have some, you know, valid interpretations, but the general uh, functional school, I'm going to, if it can be called that, uh, I should, we should disregard and then just uh, 
take a look at some of the others. What do you think? I'd, yeah, I'd agree. Obviously, the the idea that mythology and religions have a, a social function, you know, they can add to national or social cohesion is obviously true, but to reduce them to nothing but that is, um, I would say, a mistake. And as you said, some yeah. of the essentialist thinkers themselves could be atheists or materialists. They don't necessarily believe in anything of a metaphysical nature themselves. But even they are happy to admit that individuals who do have such beliefs take personal and individual value. You know, for, for them, the myth has yeah, value beyond where it slots them into society. Um, right, right. And that's what I was saying before about how just because this doesn't mean that is not the case. So something, mm. to, a myth can have multiple functions. A mythology can have multiple functions and the social functions may be very important and they exist. So in that sense, you know, Marx can be right, but it's not actually an insightful uh, uh, interpretation because it's obvious. Uh, I mean, people, pagans recognize that at the time as well. Uh, we can read like Neoplatonists like um, uh, Emperor Julian talking about, yeah, of course there are like basic social cohesion aspects to the to the public festivals and sacrifices, but that they have other meaning and that whenever a meaning is obscure or unclear, that is all the more evidence, according to Julian, that there were, there is another greater meaning behind it. And of course, um, Marx doesn't go into that, but we should give some time now, I think, to the substantive uh, theorists who uh, also I don't really like, but who actually at least recognize that there are other, uh, you know, metaphorical at least i'll go for like profane metaphorical explanation mm. for myths so uh, two of those are fraser who wrote the golden bow which was very popular um in victorian england because it it corresponded with victorian english uh progressive ideas uh, mm. of uh, human history yeah the uh, and, are familiar yeah well and if, more recently we have joseph campbell as well an american one who's massively uh, influential on things like george lucas who wrote star wars according to uh, Campbell's uh, mythological uh, framework. But Fra Campbell was influenced by um, Fraser. So before I uh, criticize, I'll say a little bit, Fraser's Golden Bow was um, really about, like, uh, he, he had a, a vision of uh, myth, uh, develop development of human religion, rather like a Marxist or a Darwinist one, which is that it evolved from a kind of primeval one, like you know, hunter-gatherer one, into a Neolithic one, which then suddenly became less about animals and shamanism and more about, um, uh, you know, uh, the cycles of the sun because, you know, it's a, they're going to have to be very conscious of the seasons and things like that and of fertility. And then from that into like a more, what he calls like, I can't remember the name he used it, something like more man-focused where like, oh no, the first, then he goes into a Bronze Age patriarchal time because he thought the mm. Neolithic would be more matriarchal and the the patriarchal religions of the Bronze Age were, with war gods and uh, sky fathers. And then finally into the uh, like the more sophisticated religions of Buddhism, Vedic Hinduism, Christianity, mm -hmm. Gnosticism and things where people are like trying to create a, a theologically advanced theory that, uh, you know, is, encompasses all the... the uh, possibilities for mankind uh, and obviously this is a hugely 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 influential and at the time it was like not only a very popular book uh, especially in Victorian England but it was also very um, it was considered you know academic um, its main uh, critics would be you know people who were more inclined to well Christians didn't like it because he also applied this to Christians and uh, the, the his his Critics were like practicing Christians, but also many historians and uh, spiritualists who uh, understood a more metaphysical uh, development of, of myth. But uh, paradoxically, his main critics now are um, still, uh, like the, the scholars in, in mainstream, in the mainstream that he, um, it, it, he was dominant in at the time, because uh, Mary Beard said that if people are more likely to find uh, Campbell now, if they wanted to buy Campbell book, they'd have to they'd go to a mystic a, a, like a, a you know in the mystery section or mystic yeah, uh, like yeah. spiritualist thing which is true you could go to glastonbury <laughs> and go into some pagan bookshop and they might sell campbell but that's ironic because he was pr pretty much an atheist he might have had some sympathies for the neoplatonists but he wasn't a, uh he wasn't anything like emperor julian mm. um 
so yeah, a lot of people influenced by him still, even neo-pagans today, unfortunately. I mean, obviously, that we say what's in his favor, like, yes, there are developments in human history that have corresponding developments in uh, human religion. So, of course, the shift from hunter-gathering to farming would be reflected in the religion. And the shift uh, in the Bronze Age to, more, like, you know, a more mi military cultures were, were, was, was also accompanied by a change in religion. But he didn't know at the time that that change was partly due to the in invasion of the Indo-European peoples, uh, a different race. But, um, yes, material factors of existence do have an influence on the shape of mythology. You can't have a myth about a boat until boats have been invented, right? You can't have a... Yeah, of course, it's, very... uh, yeah it's, it's like, our, obviously, you've got videos on what you call the Nordic boat cult. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're worth watching. But to outline, obviously, you put forward the idea that where the horse has a role in taking people to the afterlife in early, or even later, Indo-European Indo funerary rites, within... The Germanic branch of the Indo-European tradition, that role is at least partly taken by the boat instead. So, right. as you say, yeah. the, the, the material technology, where it differs, the expression of the mythology changes, even if the essential underlying point is the same. You know, the, the point right. of the funerary cult, let, let's call it, is to ensure an individual gets to their afterlife well. Um, and whether we express that through horse symbology or boat symbology is obviously a, a yeah we could change it for a cadillac back. right now we could make it you know if a modern mythology exchange it for a cadillac it wouldn't change the metaphysical right. meaning it, uh, and that's what it might people, be a little funny to do that but yeah you're right it's essentially well it might be seem funny but that's partly because of the disenchantment of the world that we have yeah, now yeah. Uh, everything that's profane the idea that comes from christianity of the separation of the profane and the sacral which didn't exist among pagans so that's why uh, I'm just going to try and get out the sun because it's a bit strong. It's a bit strange. <laughs> Blinding. Yeah. Um, no. Right. Uh, um, like, the, you know, the, as soon as chariots and horses become technologies, they're incorporated into the highest levels of mythology. So, uh, for yeah. the Indo Europeans. So, um, yeah, like a vampire just fleeing <laughs> from the sun. But, um, no, don't tell them. <laughs> they found me out. But, uh, yeah, uh, the point is that it's not changed. Like, we could have the sword in the stone, we could have the AK-47 in the stone. It wouldn't make oh, a difference. I was right about to say, perhaps when I <laughs> die, I'll be buried with a, an assault rifle and a motorbike. And right, exactly. So that's important to, to, to recognize. So in that sense, yes, there, when, when I'm saying I, I reject the materialist interpretations, I don't mean that entirely. Of course, we exist in the material. The myths are made in the material, and they re refer to things. But the material... Um, like circumstances of the myths are just uh, the framework to communicate a metaphysical truth. So that's, that's what yeah. that's what what changes, and that's something that I don't think um, is fully uh, understood by um, naturalists like Fraser. Hmm. Yeah, you know, a worldly and temporal expression of what is supernatural and eternal. I suppose. I mean, it. it, it on similar lines, I remember you were putting forward the idea that in blots performed by modern Germanic pagans, we should perhaps move away from the obsession with mead because mm. mead doesn't have so much. I mean, personally, I think mead is, is cool and it's perfectly fine to use it in libations, but you suggested mm. using champagne or whiskey, for example. Yeah. Um, I and mean, yeah. I'd have to agree. I think that makes perfect sense. Sure, because um, paganism was always a living tradition and now in its revival, it isn't. And uh, unfortunately, it's live it's it's been said quite accurately that uh by even by julius eveler and his a critique of neo-pagans uh we're, we're going to move to the traditionalists later but uh he was about the traditionalist school of interpretation and he's saying that the the neo-pagan were they were reviving a caricature of a form of religion that didn't exist for his mm. that was reconstructed the idea first the christianity typifies paganism as being more worldly and lacking the transcendent aspect that Christianity has, which is allegedly made it superior. That wasn't true. But then the, the, once that's accepted, then you have scholars in the 19th century like uh, Fraser trying to uh, make a, a whole, you know, 
on the, uh, trying to make that true and turning the myths into quite profane explanations for physical phenomena. And then people now who actually call themselves pagans practicing are trying to have a religion which isn't really a religion at all. It's just, it, 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 it's completely uh, divorced from any kind of, uh, you know, function for what uh, religion had or myth had uh, or ha has in all world cultures uh, now and uh, in all gone, bygone times. Absolutely, um, it's yeah. The, the, that that criticism of paganism may not be true of perhaps this is a bit of a you know no true Scotsman um, fantasy I'm committing, but the criticism may be true of modern pagans generally speaking, because many of them do. I'm sure you would agree, and many would agree. Not to be too elitist, but we we might look at how many neo pagans practice and think and think oh, they're doing it all wrong. Yeah. So even even where that criticism wouldn't apply to our actual pre-Christian ancestors, it does apply to probably most people who would call themselves pagan nowadays. Which is obviously yeah, a definitely. shame, but it must mm. be recognized. It's a problem because, for example, like we can, I, when I say, people might mistake saying that I'm too scholarly because I don't allow for anything which isn't in the sources, but that's not actually the case. I would be very uh, in favor of an entirely innovative uh, ritual, which was had absolutely no precedent in sources, providing it corresponded with the meaning behind those that uh, behind the original myths, real, uh, you know, traditional myths. Mm. Um, for example, like people very keen to go to Stonehenge in England and perform uh, solstice rites. Uh, but then because we know for a fact that the Stonehenge was built in alignment with the uh, solar, uh, the solstice. Um, and that is a uh, um, that's the problem is that like, why though? But why did they, we don't know why in the, we don't know anything really about the Olympic religion. Obviously it was conscious of the, the passage of the sun, um, but, uh, but without a meaning behind it, like the rituals are meaningless. They go there and they drink, they dance, they celebrate the coming up of the sun. But um, I'm not sure they really know why, like what they does the sun represent the... to them? Mm. They'll, they'll say in terms of, well, the sun is a, you know, a gaseous, ball, in like materialist terms, the sun is a gaseous ball of heat that uh, makes my, it's, it's <laughs> obscuring my face at the Isn't moment. It right? It's giving you a sort of beard of light, crazy. <laughs> yeah, my, my Peak illumined beard. But um, but for them, it's like, they'll say, you know, it's it's heat, it's warm, it's heat, it's, you know, physical f phenomena. Mm. But that is not, I don't think, precisely the, the entirety of the meaning um, for, for a traditional culture. like Actually, this, the example of the sun is given by another traditionalist uh, 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 studier of mythology, comparative mythology, René Gunon. He says, the sun and light have, like, you know, like on an, uh, there's like three layers of meaning. There's like the, the, the initial basic one, which is like um, the, 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 the heat and light of the sun, what it represents, and that the physical phenomena of that. And then beyond that, we have the idea that light represents truth because it obscures, you know, it uh, it, 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 uh, it gets rid of darkness. darkness. That which yeah. is obscured is, is revealed. And then from that, the, the, you, know, the, you know, you can go beyond that to the true esoteric meaning of like truth and light, uh, of light to, you know, the one, the, you know, the greatest and, and like uh, the totality of, of all is in, in yes. of, which is the ultimate truth, which is um, what the Neoplatonists talk about. Sorry, I'm just going to shut the door. Sure. Um, but uh, let's let's move on to. Um, if you didn't want to say anything else about uh, Fraser, we sh I was going to move on to Campbell. Um, yeah, but the only just before before I forget it, the only other association with the sun that immediately came to mind for me was um, the victory. Many. The sun is often associated with victory, particularly goddesses of victory. Mm. Um, mm. And I personally find it compelling the idea that the the, sim the symbolism of the both the halo and the crown represent an individual having attained the sun, attained a victory, which you know now shines from them in essence. Yeah, so I, that, that's maybe maybe not obviously different. But in a sense, that it's always something about like what's above. Like even in Christian symbology, the sun, the so the the halo, whatever. It, it refers to God, which is their equivalent of the one in the Christian uh, uh, theology. Yeah. Um, so we could say even actually on the subject of materialist interpretations, we could read a bit about um, 
uh, yeah, why um, even the the right wing have, which is normally we have like, well, you know, the Freudian and Marxian schools, which are materialist, but, and then the right, what was truly right would be that which opposes that. But actually the right is very much, um, and has been for a very long time, uh, quite guilty of the same things. So, um, let me just get out this. <laughs> How can I do it? Uh, okay, here we go, here we go. There we go, the sun is passing. There we go, get in the corner, get in the darkness. Hiding away in the shadows. <laughs> yes. Um, so, like, where was it? Yeah, so the, let's talk about the Nazis, for example, or Evola writes about this. Um, Hitler often mentions gods and providence of which he considers himself the designated one and executor. It is not clear what the, this providence could be if he, on the one hand, following Darwin somewhat more than Nietzsche, recognized the right of the strongest as the supreme law of life, and on the other, excluded a superstition, any intervention or supernatural order whatsoever, and gave himself over to an exaltation of modern science and the eternal laws of nature. Such an attitude was likewise characteristic of the principal ideologue of the movement, Alfred Rosenberg, who came to see in modern science a creation of the pure Aryan spirit, without taking into consideration that if technical conquests are owed to it, one also owes to them the more deleterious and irreversible spiritual devastations of the modern era, the desacralization of the universe, and a blunty enlightenment and rationalist incomprehension of the essential aspects of religion, paradoxically, going hand in hand with the mysticism of blood. If it appeared in Hitler, it was fully explicit in Rosenberg. Rites and sacraments for him were superstition, creations of a non-Aryan spirit. And uh, actually it's not mentioned in that, that criticism of Hitler but, and Rosenberg, but there's uh, one um, comparative mythologist who was popular in Nazi Germany and uh, his name was uh, Hans Gunther. Uh, I read his book, uh, do you know who I'm talking about, Redbeard? I don't think I've heard of him, actually. H Hans, Hans Gunther. Hans Gunther. Let me just get get it up on the old interwebs. Um, yeah, Hans F.K. Gunther, um, mm. a writer and eugenicist in the, in the Weimar Republic and in the Third Reich. And he did a, mm. a whole book about the, um, the spirituality of the Indo-Europeans, in which he not only, you know, would compare, like, Roman or with uh, Norse or whatever to try and get it at Indo-European religious worldview. But he actually, he, he would use just like recent, like Goethe or Shakespeare as another example of the Indo-European soul. And uh, which is, I, I can see what he's doing. It's, it's more, it's not really proper scholarly anymore. It's just sort of like a uh, nationalist rhetorical. But actually also the whole thing was just nonsense because he started, he was the one, I think it was, he was the first person to make up the idea that the true Indo-European spirit never kneels. They don't kneel in prayer, which is not, I, I said in my video, that's not the case. Indeed, we and, have, uh, yeah. And um, and also he, he, he was just generally, he was also using the term Nordic uh, interchangeably with uh, Proto-Indo-European. So he saw them as Nordic people. So you can see why it was big with Nazis. And his general idea of their spirituality was a-spiritual. It was almost atheist. So he was like contrasting them with like more like devotion, like he was saying like the devotional aspects that are visible in the Homeric literature or in the Vedas are due to the, the pollution of the pure Aryan religion by non-Aryan races. And that the Aryans were like basically in his like ideal were kind of like a very uh you know semi-atheistic german protestants basically which is completely yes, not the case yeah absolutely it seems absurd i mean we, we, we would have to grant that indeed obviously hellenic culture or, or tradition and vedic tradition probably do have some non-indo-european elements but um almost certainly so does the germanic tradition contain yeah. some some elements of pre indo as we said earlier the the, the presence of boats and again, even even if the essential, even if the the essential point is is transferred, it shows that the form of the religion can change over time. And yeah. I, I think certain, certain motifs within Germanic tradition are probably pre-Indo-European. Mm. But the, 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 I don't agree with 
like this uh, dual. The, the point is that the the duality that is presented here, the dichotomy between you know the uh, the, the the rationalist Indo-European and the and the yeah. superstitious non-Indo-European, in meaning that in the modern sense of the word superstition, not in the Roman sense. It, mm -hmm. That's not uh, that's not really borne out. I mean, rituals and sacrifices and devotion to God. That's the that's how you define the European religion. That's what it was. That's how it's typified in every example. And this uh, this this version of the Aryan spirit that the Nazis celebrated was and is a modern uh, Protestant influenced uh, post rationalist you know Enlightenment uh, yeah. fantasy. It Absolutely. didn't exist in the ancient world, and um, whether you look, you, you see these examples, whether they come from Marxists or the National Socialists, or from just uh, stuffy British people like uh, Fraser, who's Scottish, um, it's just not true. But uh, moving on from them to the 20th century, we have this guy I mentioned before, Joseph Campbell, who's very popular because of his book, which has, uh, and he's influenced by Fraser, and he's influenced by Freud, so he's quite much a materialist, but he also has some influence from Carl Jung, who's Freud's student, who was very more borderline on bordering on what's called a mystic. And I think that Campbell was similar to Jung in some ways because Campbell's a mainstream academic, you know, uh, in the sense like Jung was, like he was one of the founders of the school of psychology. But unlike Freud, he kind of skirted. The, uh, the boundaries of what was acceptable in mainstream academia by doing things that would risk having him labeled as a mystic. Um, so I wonder whether when you see very purely atheistic of materialist interpretations in Campbell, whether he is just doing them for the same reason that uh, Jung did and also that Avola accused Iliad of just to remain uh, reputable in mainstream academia and not to be seen as some, you know, weirdo wizard kind of guy. Or something. Yeah, the I think Eliada. I don't really know much about I can't speak uh, Romanian. Romanian uh, was it yeah. orthography or no? Not wouldn't be orthography. Maybe it would be pronunciation. Um, but reading his "The Sacred and the Profane," which I thought was a great book, he he does try to be quite factual. He, you know, he, uh, you, you can tell that he's um. There we I have got it. it. Here. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I, I think he, you can tell that he tries to stay quite. At least sounding like he's being just an anthropologist. He's just talking about what other people believe. But something about it, and other people have said the same. Personally, I think that he probably had some sympathy for um, a metaphysical or spiritually or religiously informed outlook on life. I think he definitely. I, I think Iliad Iliada was was very much more uh, on. Uh, my side, our side, if I can speak on your behalf, I'd say like yeah, that's, more, that's right. <laughs> an appreciation of metaphysical um, aspects of myth. Um, mm. uh, definitely. And, and possibly Dumazil, Georges Dumazil as well. But Eliada and Dumazil are still like acceptable in mainstream academia. Um, Campbell uh, is, I don't know as well. I mean, Campbell is more materialist than they are for sure. Like, but his, uh, he was very acceptable but i think the reason that campbell's less acceptable now isn't because he's considered so much a mystic but because his theory was meant of myth is meant to be all-encompassing rather like the golden bow where it provides a framework for myth um like joseph campbell created this theory of the hero in myth as like a kind of like his idea was that all um mythologies not just indo-european but like semitic all human mythologies follow a certain framework and the reason for that is not like uh, the traditionalists like Ganon or Avila would say because there's a primordial truth that they're all approaching that makes them converge towards certain uh, essential as truths of being but rather because there's like a biological function of myth that is issuing from human experience so that myths have to follow certain patterns uh, and that's not really convincing from it's like a pseudo-scientific Basically, yeah, like yeah. the idea that all these, the hero, there's the hero, he goes on the journey, he meets this uh, person. Is that the, the monomyth then, cycle? I've seen that. Yeah, the monomyth. Yeah, that's Joseph Campbell. Yeah. So, um, and actually, I like the monomyth cycle. I like what he's done is standardize all these different mythologies from, you know, uh, from all these different places and show that there are commonalities to it, which actually reinforces 
the perennial traditionalist school, mm. a lot of what they're saying, but he doesn't believe in that. He's doing he, it because his he's explanation trying to for what he sees is, is, where, yeah. is where we differ here. And also, there's also the problem, I think, and this is the reason why materialist mainstream academics now don't like Campbell, is because they see like myth as having too many complicated uh, and regional functions that, that aren't encompassed by this universal explanation. So they want to say like, you know, something, some Hawaiian island may have created a myth about some sea god that specifically helped them cater and deal with one materialist uh, social problem that they had at that time uh, and mm. nothing else. So that, so even within the materialist school, there's all these like divisions and things and like, and uh, people come in and out of vogue. So I don't think Fraser, like the mainstream materialists don't really like Fraser or Campbell anymore. Uh, and of course, traditionalists and like true metaphysicians aren't really that impressed by them either, but there are these sort of um, other this in between people who are neither academics nor uh, metaphysicians, and they're kind of you know using the old the old fashioned materialists and trying to reinterpret and interpret them for the purposes of practicing modern paganism. Okay, I can see that for sure. Yeah, but I thought uh, before before it steps my mind, it's very interesting. You mentioned um, the perennialist idea that different traditions have myths which share elements and share sometimes huge aspects of their form because they're all approaching a certain truth. And uh, that just made me think, it's a very interesting way to describe it because typically, at least as I, I understand it, a lot of perennialists and traditionalists put forward the idea that there was a single truth which all current traditions are what you might call downstream de-evolutions yeah, of. the primordial, the primordial truth. The tr it's, primordial it's interesting that you, you, I just wanted to know, so what, what do you think of the possibility of, which is, you know, this is almost what it sounds like you were implying with the idea that truths are approaching a truth, isn't moving up to it. Do you think it is possible okay. that a tradition could be founded, for say, in, in a sense, and built up from the ground by, just to, to you know, to, to illustrate the, the idea, perhaps generations of mystics who would get towards a primordial truth from a starting point of a, a, a unique revelation to one of them and and him passing what he saw on to others. Do you, do you see roughly what I'm saying? Like, would it be possible yeah. to, to get a, a valid tradition, not from a preceding one, but from, from scratch, if you will? Um, could... Well, the perennial, the perennial tradition school would say categorically no, because even though, even if such like wise masters existed who were capable of that, they would only have that wisdom from the following of existing traditions, because mm. it's about the transmission of this wisdom uh, and the forms of it. Tradition, the original form of transmission would be oral tradition, the me memorizing of the Vedas or whatever yeah. was the thing, or, uh, or, or the same th same things applied in scaldic poems or whatever they did in Greece. But the um, and then later into the written religions like the modern Semitic ones. But uh, uh, to start from scratch, a religion would mean it would have no authority among a people or a culture except that which was claimed. Uh, and the way that you would establish that authority would be anti-traditional in itself. So if I made up a new religion right now and said, I've made it based on like, I'm really good at studying religion. So I've made it, I promise you it's all, it's all right. And I've got to make everyone believe me. I've got to, I mean, most people aren't capable of understanding that, right? And ex like the most people who follow tradition only follow it in an exoteric level because they're not capable mm -hmm. of going further. So how would I get those kind of people to believe in this religion? Only through lying, only through deceit. And that therefore I've already started on a, on a path of like, of deception and, uh, and you know, anti-traditional things. It would be a, a very dangerous thing to do. Um, so yeah, I would say I'm against that. And that's why when I talk about reviving paganism, uh, I'm not talking about reconstruct, I'm not talking about making a new religion. I'm not talking about reviving paganism as it exactly was practiced back then. I'm tra talking about continuing the currents of spirituality that exist now in the West via transmission through Christianity and through uh, academia as well, so that we can Re, uh, re-establish among the initiated an understanding of the true meaning of these of these of our myths and of our, of our heritage uh, and and the esoteric you know 
perspectives within them. But um, so not not trying to, you know, sidestep the past 1300 years of, uh, of, what, of, of what, how paganism has changed, trans, transferred through Christianity, but rather like how Christians uh, mu like mutated Christianity to try to uh, place it within the framework of a pagan society. We will now, well, I seek to do the same thing now with the, what I consider to be decaying and uh, compromised form of uh, post-Christianity in the West. That yes. what left of it, but it does ha have remnants of you know really valuable uh, you mm -hmm. know transmission of the pagan uh, wisdom from before the conversion, and then w mixed with what we have in academia, what we have in historical sources, how we can interpret um, archaeological sources, we can get very close to it, and it's and and most importantly at all from a metaphysical perspective, comparative mythology, which is why I wanted to do this talk right now. Yeah, it's yeah, I, I'd say my my feelings on what um what what we should do in essence are are the same but uh yeah i, I found th the thought was interesting to me the um the idea that divine wisdom can only be transferred from someone who had it before you to to you now versus the idea that you could come to it yourself somehow it's, yeah uh, but i'm sure you can come to it I'm sure an course, individual I'm... can come to it, like through no personal gnosis, revelation. Yes, yeah. That's that's actually in every tradition, even like the anti-pagan religions of the Semit Semitic peoples had prophets, you know, like Muhammad or whatever, even like Adam Smith, whatever he's called, for Mormons. So it's kind of like, yeah, you can um, you can come to that. But the point is about the transmission to other people. Like, not you can't expect everyone in the populace to have their own gnosis that gives no, them the indeed. same. Uh, well, I suppose thing. So, uh, Buddha was was an example of that sort of thing he yes I, I, either we say that buddhism is wholly a tradition downstream of hinduism that branched out from it or we say that it is new and derived from an individual's uh, gnosis that 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 he experienced yeah i don't or, really know or, how or, or combination of those two because yeah i, I think, suppose that I makes that's sense. the truth really because he was informed by the hindu society he had been Indeed, raised in. yeah just it's equivalent i always say like uh, Buddha is to Hinduism as Jesus is to Judaism. Mm. I think there's a direct equivalence there. So I it's very, could, very yeah. different. But it's that also, it's also, um, it's very it's significantly different uh, theologically and in and also exoterically as well in practice. But it's also, uh, it's d grown directly from it as well, uh, and it's dependent on the pre-existence of it of the other. That makes sense, I suppose. Understanding. Buddhism in that way, yeah, makes me more more inclined than I already was to to think to think as you mentioned earlier that really a tradition, at least on some level, has to be informed by something that came before. It can't really yeah. exist in a complete void. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's dangerous to to, to even attempt that. Mm. But. Um, if we go back to Campbell, I was going to say something in his defense as well, because um, he also, he had like, uh, let me see, he had provided like the functions of myth into um, certain sections. And some of these are entirely um, profane. And uh, but some of them, especially one, like, even though he himself, I don't think he's really like, he's very, much concerned with like the practical function of myth uh, as well, which is, and I have no doubt that that is um, part of it. Like, uh, uh, but the, uh, in the functions of myth listed um, for that he comes up with is like there's a the one of them which I really agree with is the metaphysical function, uh, which uh, is described here a, a summary of it in uh, Wikipedia on his Wikipedia pages, uh, the absolute mystery of life, what he called transcendent reality cannot be captured directly in words or images. Symbols and mythic metaphors, on the other hand, point outside themselves and into that reality. They are what Campbell called being statements. And their enactment through ritual can give to the participant a sense of that ultimate mystery as an experience. Mythological symbols touch and exhilarate centers of life beyond the reach of reason and coercion. First function of mythology is to reconcile waking consciousness to the mysterium tremendum, 
et fashionans of this universe as it is. So actually, that's mm. probably the highest uh, interpretation that we get from anyone in the you know in the in the materialist essentialist category. Yeah, that that, that phrase was uh, was um, Otto's, wasn't it? You, you mentioned earlier. I Which forget Otto is his first name or, or yeah, his second uh, name. Yeah, yeah. Th what um, did Otto say? Uh, about the, the Mysterium Tremendum, et, so the, the Latin eludes me, mm. but uh, the idea that the experience is both fascinating and terrifying, you know, it's, it can be almost overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but it and was... That was is, it I think that is... Heidegger, did you say? Oh, I can't type. Otto Weininger. I think it's the what of I uh, um so yeah uh yeah I think that he's pretty that's good but the other things he has like um the pedagogical function is a person who goes through life uh he encounters psychological per uh, problems and the uh, myth serves as a, a, a guide that's probably true as well. That has that thing. The cosmological function for pre-modern societies myth served as a proto-science offering explanation for physical phenomena. Uh, I think that is only true in a very limited sense. Like, you know, peasants are obviously going to say like, for them, if they want to know where thunder comes from, saying that it's source hammer banging on something is a satisfactory explanation. Yeah. But that was not the, when they talk, and, and this is the problem when they talk about function and utilitarian interpretation of myth, even including the metaphysical one, or well, less so, but it's it's assuming that this is a tool that's been built by men for a job in, in a quite, in, in, in a secondary sense where it's rather that um, this, I believe, like myth and and uh, and the, the deities involved in them emerge quite naturally from the human from a pre-modern or from a traditionalist ex experience of being in the world so that these these are truths that are evident this is a way of engaging with divinity with the what not just the world but with what is beyond the world uh and that's the most important thing and then secondary things like peasants saying oh yeah well thor is thunder that can't that's an, not that's another aspect so yes in a way i agree with campbell for like attributing these functions but the problem with it is is that he's he's kind of looking at it backwards like it, it's like a it's too much of that marxist influence of like religion as a form of control or as like mm. a, a substitute science like fraser would think it's yeah as you said earlier that it, it it's practical use doesn't take away from its reality indeed the, the, the two could inform each other it could be said that um a religious tradition enforcing a certain social structure let's say within a traditional society featuring a, you know a holy king who orders society according to transcendent principles the, the peasantry being kept in line by this you know by the constraints of religion so to speak mm, mm. also allows them to participate in in the supernatural order of things uh to an extent beyond which they would be able to without the the social conformity enforced by their religion so the yeah. the practical function of it brings to them the higher reality of it uh, in, in in that sense yeah yeah i go with that so it's like a it, yeah it, it's wrong it's to divorce them from each other completely it, it, again yeah. it's like you said earlier it's a mistake to divorce the sacred and the profane completely in that yeah. way yeah it's the idea of trying to you shouldn't try and separate them too much. Like it mm. certainly didn't matter that this distinction becomes more necessary with Christianity uh, because of the way it sees the world as kind of like a testing ground and an undesirable place for existence. People who live in the world are to be pitied. I believe it is the one uh, Christian, it might say that in the Bible or one uh, theologian or Pope said it, uh, but the idea is to go beyond the world f from in, into the next world. And, th uh, and that is a, uh, the only purpose of the world and, and and from that perspective everything in the world that does not concern this goal is you know relegated to a completely other sphere and then having inherited this like framework even in post-christian thought from atheists they still impose it backwards retroactively onto pre-christian thought where it didn't exist and cannot exist um and that i think is 
I think a lot of pagan, you know, neo-pagans, that's one of the mistakes they fall into as well, because they're trying to see things in terms of like practical, you know, profane, because they see like the superstitious Christian world and they want to show what's better than that. Well, the enlightenment, which is a Christian phenomenon, actually, <laughs> uh, is, is saying that, you know, rationality is the highest thing in man. So if we can attribute rational explanations to all these myths of our ancestors, then that's actually uh, ennobling but it isn't a new thing. It's it's just uh, it's it shows limited. It shows the limitation of Western perspectives on being, um, very much absent in in Indian philosophies, even competing mm. and, and contradictory ones. It's always there in India, in China, in uh, in the East, and it was there in pre-Christian Europe too, where the idea of being uh, the world itself is, and you can see it most. Perfectly, I think perfectly example is the weird in Anglo-Saxons uh, idea, which is, you know, the world is uh, of being is integrated with consciousness. So mm -hmm. like, uh, like Atman in Hinduism is the pure undifferentiated consciousness of, you know, without uh, the um, contingent aspects of being within Un uh, of personal consciousness. Yeah, so unconditioned. Um, well, weird is integrated with it, with the pure consciousness and with our individual consciousness, so that when you have a personal experience with something, it's you see like sync what uh, people call nowadays synchronicities, like events unfolding, like extraordinary coincidences that you can mm. interpret through uh, f only due to your personal experiences and your personal experience of consciousness. Uh, that is a uh, that reveals a version of the world that can't be um, understood either in the framework of uh, of, of mainstream of, of no normal profane science of the West, nor by um, a lot of like Christian theology, really, like Western religious thought it doesn't really account for it either. Indeed, yes, yeah. so the, the 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 use of the word unfolding, I think, is very. I think that's, an, that's another big difference between a common western understanding of how the world came to be um in that the, the, t mo most people's idea whether they believe it or not is informed by christianity and the idea that god created the world and that's it that's the world now it's done mm. and it's now sort mm. of separate i think that the, the correct understanding of things at least with within, within the indo-european tradition is is, is an emanationist one in which yeah the what the world of becoming is a constant unfolding or outpouring or outflowing from the world of being it's it's not a one thing's here the rest is over there it's a it's, it's like a constant yeah unfolding or flowing is exactly how, yeah, how yeah. it should be described and i think understanding the world to to be that way immediately changes quite how you understand the relationship between where you are now and what's what's beyond, so to speak. Right. It's much less a, a distinct binary here, there. Yes, and we could get closer to that kind of, we need to try, it's hard for us because we have the, the, the initial framework, well, the main dominant framework is not Christianity that we're raised in it, even if we call ourselves Christians, it's this secular uh, post-Christian, uh, you know, worldview. Yeah. But even whether we, raised as Christians or as, as atheists in the West, which most of us are uh, like raised in semi-Christian, semi-atheist, uh, like limbo state. Um, <laughs> you still need to uh, overcome that. And people think, people who, you know, respond with, you know, just hatred to the outward forms of Christianity and the rejection of it, they don't actually um, come to terms with any of the stuff uh, that would be necessary for them to go beyond or, or outside Christianity anyway. So there's real, no, there's really no function for the rejection of Christianity except for an outward, you know, an exoteric uh, replacement yeah, of the, um, Christian ritual with some made-up rituals. <clears throat> yes, I, I definitely think there's a level of over rejecting Christianity or rejecting Christianity in the, in the wrong areas among, particularly among Germanic neo pagans. I think. Um, yeah. A bit of particularly common is we mentioned the idea of the afterlife and whether or not life on Earth is is worth living other than as a testing grounds. You know that that idea earlier. Mm. A, a common thing that I see among discussions on the afterlife with modern Germanic neo pagans is 
someone will ask a question about the afterlife completely fairly being new to the, the whole thing and they'll immediately be met with answers like just avoiding the question with with the idea well actually as pagans we don't really care about the afterlife as much as christians do anyway and i just <laughs> find that a bit of a cure you know it's okay even if that's true that you don't care as much that doesn't mean that you don't care at all but to me it's it, it's it's one expression and it of doesn't a, a really resolve like, it doesn't it doesn't resolve the question in, in the in the first place the reason yeah, for answer, really asking is. it it's mm. it's it's looking at christians and thinking well they add two and two together to get five so i'm going to add two and two together to get three it's like cutting yeah. it's a you yeah. know it's a form of cutting off your nose to spite your face just yeah it's it, it's it's trying too hard to be different yeah um, for the sake of it it's quite it's quite obtuse and uh, absurd in some respect but there is um there is i think like uh, that's why my favorite my thing my favorite comparative mythological school is traditionalism but i don't follow um ever like a like a prophet like he's not my muhammad or something i don't believe everything he believes or, or ganon for that matter either but we can take a lot from it and we can and some like you say the Germanic pagans who sometimes they they um they just go by doing the opposite of what christians do or sometimes they say you know they're very focused on what sources we have and that's good. I mean, it's good to be uh, knowledgeable about the, if you want to practice Germanic paganism, be very knowledgeable as you can about the sources and to try and, but, but what is different is about you need to f know a framework of how you interpret uh, the sources and in, which is, that has to be academic, the interpretation, but the incorporation of the, uh, of your understanding of uh, medieval Germanic paganism into a, a living, uh, tradition or li uh, a living ritual is is not academic anymore. Now you're talking about you're looking for a framework for that incorporation. And for me, uh, uh, radical traditionalists are provide that uh, and the basis for it. And I think Evelis really go for it, even though he wrote a specific book attacking or like, mini book um, attacking neo paganism. But he said to himself that he considered the old pre Christian religion superior to Christianity, and he was certainly not an atheist. People might not understand that if they, unless they understand that he's not, he's making a distinction between what is actual paganism and what isn't, and what he practiced, which he sometimes called himself a Catholic pagan. But the, the yeah. thing about that is he was neither he was neither a Catholic nor a pagan in the sense that the old pagans were or the neo pagans were. He used that to, to, ex to explain what he was what he was doing, which is carrying on the valid current of tradition from paganism through Christianity into the modern world and not denying where you live, not pretending you live in the Bronze Age, not pretending you live as a, in the Stone Age or not pretending you live as in medieval Christianity, even except when you live and what where you live and what you are. And, um, you know, and in that framework, when we're talking about the Germanic afterlife, I think it's very useful. And I had this discussion on Facebook yesterday because um, I posted something about like, some other Facebook page mentioned like the overconcern with Valhalla, uh, Valhalla, it's like a surrogate heaven and so many people are assuming they go there. And I post, uh, reposting it saying, you know, in the sources even, we can see that Valhalla is not even just for like the elect or the, like the upper class or even the warrior class. It's for even smaller, a tiny concentration of people. Yeah. And that it certainly isn't really like a major thing in 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 their conception of the destination for the the soul after the into the afterlife so and and but it, more interesting discussion developed in the comments as well from that which is via interpretation on by Evelyn who writes in metaphysics of war about Valhall and other equivalents in other Indo-European traditions and also even in the jihadic tradition of, of Islam there is like a an essential idea of like which he call, he he sums up with the blood of the of the warrior is closer to the gods than the ink of the prophets. Yes, uh, but yeah, it's a great quote. But it's quote. Like, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. And uh, yeah, I, wanted to, is, I wanted to say roughly exactly that. Um, it's again, it comes back to the idea of well, two and two isn't five, so it must be three. You're absolutely right that indeed Valhalla isn't this idea that oh, everyone wants to go there and it's you know it's heaven for good people. Um, that's obviously not the case, but I've seen recently a lot of Germanic pagans. I don't know. I don't know if it's some desire to be sort of hipster and contrarian, but they they love. Recently, there's been a current of this idea that Valhalla is actually 
very undesirable. Not only is it not for everyone, but it's undesirable. It's actually a consolation prize for those who are slain while raiding abroad and have their bodies dumped into a mass grave on a battlefield rather than what they really want, which, which would be to be buried with their families and rest with them. And I think that the, this is where comparative analysis of mythology becomes very valuable. Because looking at only the Germanic sources we have, you can look at that and think, actually, you're, you're right. It is just for slain warriors specifically. Kind of doesn't seem that desirable to just sort of enter this right. giant yeah. war fighting camp for eternity. But when you take a step back from Germanic mythology, you can then look at other traditions and see, well, as you said, those who die in Islamic tradition on jihad are given a, a special uh, sort of paradise, a, a paradise, paradise or state or realm. Yeah. Yeah. In, in Homeric, in, in, the, in Homer's writings, we see the idea that when the Greek heroes are slain, the gods sort of steal them away and give them a new immortal body to live on the Isle of Heroes, which is Right. From the descriptions, it's clearly desirable. We see. Yeah, and it's equivalent. It was in well. some native South American myth. Again, I think it, uh, Evola mentions it. I think in both Metaphysics of War and Revolt, heroes and kings get to, you know, particularly if they die warriors' deaths, get to live in the house behind the sun with the gods. So the idea that this sort of afterlife is undesirable just because only a few people get it under specific circumstances is, I think, uh, a, a, it's a mistake to think that way, and it's a mistake that derives it's, it's from a to look tunnel at it, vision the on the Eddas yeah. instead of looking at myth in general and seeing actually... Because, because as, as they everyone knows, and they, everyone likes to say this, but they don't in practice acknowledge it properly in their interpretation, which is that the Germanic sources are incomplete. We have only a very yes. limited scope from a Christian writing 200 years at least after the official conversion of his country. And deliberately... He, he, I mean, he wants to communicate some of this stuff, committing it down, you know, for like for memory. But he certainly doesn't want to let the esoteric meaning of Vorhol come about, mm. or of indeed of like he of Helheim or anything. But we can see that the underworld is used in Greek and uh, Greek myth and other Indo-European things in a non. Uh, it's something. It's not all, all bad. It's not like hell isn't actually all bad, but it's not. The, the, the really difficult to swallow thing that Evel is trying to say is that most of you will do not have a truly immortal soul as we think it does. Because yes, when yeah. we talk about the soul, we're usually thinking of like me, but without a body, right? But I've talked, I tried to say this in the metaphysical, uh, the, the, the tripartite soul video. Like, what is I? What right do your personal, like, afflictions and your your like habits and your personality which is the product of your experiences and your parents and your your childhood and your schooling and is you know metaphysically uh, in like n unimportant things what right do they have to immortality what is the function of their permanent endurance in the cosmos is it being realistic it's, there is none. Yeah, it's, uh... there is none they are not you're not immortal you're going, these things will die with your body. They have no right to go on. There's no reason of that they should go on. And the idea and belief that they will endure is a consolation for a weak, a, a weak personality who, who can't face the prospect of dissolution. The, uh, the truth is that um, the underworld is where, you know, the soul goes to dissolve into obscurity and to cease to exist. Yes, the yeah. and and the the way that it can endure for longer is through what the Indo-Europeans called klaus, which is immortal fame, and that's reflected mm. in the Norse uh, the, the the famous lines from Havamal: "Cattle die, kinsmen die, but one thing shall never die: the name and deeds of a famous man." And uh, that is something that is one way to go beyond death. But uh, and as I say in the tripartite soul video, the real way to go beyond to really transcend death. It, besides mere fame uh, among the living it, uh, and the, is, is, is to go beyond life in life and therefore when you're you're going beyond your personality and your your the, the personal aspects of being then then whether in the case of the warrior that would be through a um, an experience of war that distances you from your the limitations of material existence so you're like you're experiencing war in, in a transcendent way uh like you're not concerned 
with your well-being as your physical you know uh, body mm -hmm. anymore you're you're fighting in a in a pure way like our like our journal like yes yeah, yeah as advised for the, for the in the bhagavad gita of, of, exactly yeah, i know avola talks about the uh the crisis the warrior will account it in war which i don't know exactly what terms he uses but what i took away was it, it sort of crystallizes the self you know it it separates what is higher and more true of the self from what is lower and illusory and and ephemeral and and therefore allows the former to to continue um through death because because it's realized what it is uh if that if that makes sense right that's sort of roughly what i and there are other like in other traditions there are other paths to this besides the path of war but unfortunately in the limited germanic source we only have one description of this transcendent mm. uh and that's for whole which is only for warriors so like if you're practicing Germanic paganism as, as an Indo-European perennialist, and you understand that this is just one aspect of, of uh, the transcendent state of the, of, the, of the soul, the warrior state, and uh, it probably doesn't apply to most of us. It doesn't apply to me. I'm not li likely to die in that way uh, or to experience war in that way, uh, even though I come from a line of, of uh, many decorated military heroes. So, But you might say I, I come... I might argue, I won't, but I could try and argue that I come from a, a modern Chattria caste. But uh, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't matter because that's not, I'm not a soldier, I'm not uh, that lifestyle. So it's no point pretending. Uh, you can't uh, pretend. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and, and that's something, um, that, that's what we discussed in that comment section. I thought that was mm -hmm. quite interesting. But uh, of course, if we become too narrowly focused on these limited Germanic sources, we can't actually make a tradition out of Germanic paganism. We need to expand it into uh, a framework of interpretation uh, from comparative mytho mythology, which is one of the reasons we have important discussions like this about what kind of uh, schools of comparative mythology exist and how useful they are. And secondly, we need to also look at, uh, you know, well, well, it's part of it, but we need to decide which other mythologies are more relevant for drawing from. And my personal feeling, which isn't reflected in any of the traditionalists I'm aware of, is that we should just look at Indo-European traditions, really. Yes. Yeah, I think um, certain elements are to be found across all religions. And as I said, it, it, it's vindicating to see the concept behind Valhalla, as, as we said earlier, found in, say, Islam and Aztec or Inca. I forget which culture it was, but, you know, some pre-Latin South American culture. Pre but I probably agree that the, the easiest thing is to look at other Indo-European traditions because it, it, it's just it's more closer. likely that uh, any mm. given idea found in one of them would also have been found in Germanic tradition. Um, obviously, yeah. Hinduism is one that many like to look at. The Vedic tradition is, is considered important because of its being fairly well-preserved. I know at least a couple of people I've spoken to are really big on Avestan tradition. They say that, that they criticize a lot of those who look to India um, to, to fill the blanks in Germanic tradition, if you will, um, and say that, not that it's wrong to do that, but actually they, they really say that looking at Persia would be, would be better. Um, I don't really know why exactly that is, but that, it makes me want to read some of the Avestas and, and, and relevant literature myself and sort of see what I make of it. It's something that I've, it's a sentiment well, I've seen. I don't know why someone would say that, but um, I, th I certainly think there's value in Avestan sources. But like we can see, if we look at like the Avestan, the Persian sources, the Vedic sources, and then mix that with looking at the, you know, what we know about the Afghan, uh, pre Islamic Afghanistan and the Kalash. You can see that they derive all from the same source, but that they're different and they're developed in different ways. Mm. And that's a good way if you're trying to get back to, because the really, the uh, Andronovo people, the Andronovo culture were uh, from were the people who brought the Aryan religion to India, the Kalash and the Persians. And the unlike the Persians, the Kalash and the Indians, the Andronovo people were white people like us and they, had a culture probably much more similar to Germanic paganism than to modern Hinduism. Um, so they, and we can see that they had 
God, they had didn't have as many of the same gods as the uh, in India. They didn't have this uh, monotheistic sort of tendency that's emerging in Persia and, and in, in the Western literature. And they didn't have so much influential uh, influence from Islam that we see in the Kalash uh, religion now. So there was something else going on, but it was involving belief in gods, sacrifices to animals, uh, sacrifices of animals to well, the gods. <laughs> to animal yeah. totems, very shamanic. Sacrifices to what in Kalash religion are like mountain, they're called, translated as mountain fairies or elves. <laughs> I like that. And that's, we know, that's quite <laughs> yeah, well, 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 that's how they translate it, but it's essentially the same thing. There's like entities yeah. that are not <clears throat> divine. They are telluric. Uh, supernatural entities that can be appeased with sacrifice like gods and that exists in all indo-european religions where they call fairies in ireland or elves in scandinavia elves so there's indeed. something or, else um, besides gods whites obviously yeah yeah land land spirits which yeah. uh, which is a way of in it's enchant the enchantment of of the material realm it's it's a, a different from the transcendent uh sense of the divine which is beyond this world the there is also the the enchantment divinity of within the world yeah, well, yeah. divinity, but you know, something like uh, uh, yeah, perhaps there needs to be a new word for it, or maybe yeah, not yeah. a new word, maybe an old word. Uh, yeah, there probably yeah, is. I, 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 yeah, I understand. That's so, uh, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and it's, I uh, think like I, I think I think it's good to read the Avestans and the Vedas personally. If you want to be a Germanic pagan and you want to incorporate them, then there's two reasons you can read like the Avestans, as you said, to like there is going to be commonality, so we can get more to that original Germanic spirituality. But there's also another way of thinking of it, which is quite valid, which I think Richard Rudgley, he, he also said, like, the Germanic paganism got cut off. And as we said, like, pagan religions were living and changing. It got cut off from development, whereas in Persia and in India, it continued to develop. And what he says is into a more sophisticated, myth, uh, metaphysically sophisticated religion. And I think that's mm. sort of the view a lot of like Ganon and people would say too. And even like materialists like uh, Fraser thinking about the stages of evolution, like a progress within religion. So if you take accept that, then you would think that Germanic religion would do something too. But I don't entirely take all that on board because I don't like that progressive linear idea of human history and yeah, applying it's... evolution to religion. But I do think it's possible that yeah, Germanic religion would have changed, and maybe we would have approached concepts like Atman uh, and Dharma, uh, and quite you know this you know this metaphysically sophisticated, it must be said, uh, the tradition of India would have been reflected in Germany or in Scandinavia or England. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, could could we even would we definitely be right to say that that level of metaphysical sophistication wasn't present, and we simply yeah, of course. Yeah, I think I personally, I, sure, I I'm personally inclined to th say it was present. Uh, you know, and actually, Ganon thought it was present among the Celts. He the Celtic and people. The Celts are he, interesting. Yeah, he thought it was, but he's French, so yeah. <laughs> Bias. But, I mean, yeah. I have. I don't know the source of this. I remember did seeing. I, I did see one time the idea before that, that, that the Celts believed the world to be made of light, which I found very interesting. Sort of metaphor, which um, I, I suppose it's, it almost sounds. It could sound to be just wishy-washy, because sort of wicker esque nothing. But it, it could be said to be a, a, a quite a, a, a metaphysically sophisticated idea of the world being sort of that that, that emanationist idea of it being a sort of a radiance out from a divine source. Um, if the latter, then yeah, quite interesting. Yeah, but we 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 can't. That just we're coming back again to the the inadequacy of uh, the sources that we have. Mm. Um, we can certainly build the exoteric aspects of the religions uh, of, of paganism, European paganism. No problem. We've got quite enough of that, and not only from the sources, the historical sources, but from the living folk traditions. Like yes. right now, everyone in this part of the world, the West Country, we're getting ready to sing to the wassailing trees. They shoot the guns. For the trees, hmm. uh, and they and they put pieces of toast in the tree to ask the trees for a good harvest the next year. Obviously, this comes directly from previous pagan times, but it's been preserved throughout Christianity to get there. But it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have any higher esoteric meanings. It's a purely exoteric uh, superstition uh, among you know peasants. Um, so we've got that. We've got the exoteric 
quite easy to revive, but it's it's uh, reviving the esoteric and the true higher meaning, which makes religions yeah. really valuable. That's the problem, and um, I think we can we can um, look at Hinduism and how it developed, how Indo-European developed there to, for some guidance, and uh, and and also look at the the way that the uh, common like the common peasants and their rituals in India. Uh, just engage with the tradition in their way and how that is uh, contrasted or complemented by the Brahman, Brahmanic or esoteric yeah. and higher interpretation. I was going to mention that that distinction. I mean, uh, if, if, if anything would be returning to the idea that early Germanic pagans, you know, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Germanic pagans, medieval, um, might have had a, a level of metaphysical sophistication, that's we have things like the figure of Jarl in the, is it the Rigsthula? Um, you know, yeah, where, yeah, yeah, where the, the, the three classes are described, you know, they're coming into being as described. Yeah, and yeah, the figure of Jarl is mentioned classes. as, you know, having knowledge that the others don't. You know, he, as a child, is taught about the runes. And if we take rune to mean mystery, knowledge. Yeah. It, um, it makes perfect sense that, yeah, you know, the the ruling class, the class which, from whom presumably priests would have been drawn, um, as we know was the case in in Rome, it was you know the patricians who who, who would have fed individuals to not literally um, you know would have put forward individuals to join the the major collegia. It makes sense that among a certain class, the esoteric understanding of the religion was was present and maintained, um, and that's exactly what we would not be quite so likely to have given to us through our source yeah. material. Um, yeah, the Celts, I think again the Celts obviously had the Druid class. There's also an old Norwegian folk song, and I can't remember what it's called. I was just trying to Google it, but it's like it's so beautiful, and it it's basically the the chorus says something like, "But who?" It's about like the loss of the of the uh, the Jarl class, basically the the, mm. the the who know the the class who know the runes, and it's like a lamentation saying. Who can move the runes now that we ourselves cannot? Um, and it's saying like, you know, all these things will continue, but who will move the runes now that we cannot? And it goes lists like all the changes in the world. Uh, and it's an old, it's haunting, but obviously it's uh, it's recognizing that the, uh, the, you know, rune, rune is a word that exists in Proto-Germanic prior to its application to uh, the script. To, to the letters, and, yes. Yeah, we don't know. For example, we know that there's a cognate with uh, Norse word rune in Anglo-Saxon, run, and that means esoteric secret. But we don't know if that was ever used, even though Anglo-Saxons had runes, like uh, these ones on my ring are Anglo-Saxon runes. It looks the, oh, the same yes. as the Norse ones. But we don't know <laughs> if, as far as I'm aware, if that word rune was ever applied to these symbols. But we know that the word rune existed in, for, to mean esoteric secret. So yeah. anyway, that's just a here and there an English thing. But like the the meaning of secret was also present in Norse uh, mm. language, probably, um, and in and other Germanic languages, they have that cognate. So hidden secret. And of course, people are sometimes now say there is a problem with some people always wanting to say runes are always magic, and they every time you see runes are magic, and then people will point to like jokes written in runes, silly yes, like rude absolutely. phrases, very profane stuff like someone has a chair and they write chair on it, or something like that in <laughs> runes. Yeah, it has yeah. it has like a normal non magic uh, meaning too, but a profane meaning. But it definitely the fact that they were called runes is very revealing that there is certain. Yeah, certain, you know, meaning beyond that. There's a was a function of of, of like a learned class. I mean, we know and from certain source material that they were used for magical purposes. You know, we, we have warnings yeah. against carving the wrong ones and, Eggle, uh, and Eggle, my, sorry, my, yeah. my my personal um take on it might be that the the runic script interfaced with the idea of runes as secrets, as magical things, or you know bits of divine knowledge uh roughly akin to i don't know if you've looked at uh modern sort of chaos magic or you know sigil magic where practitioners will write phrases of intent and organize them into sigils and the sigils will then you know, carry the magical effect forward is, mm. is the, the idea behind it i think yeah. more or less runic magic as practiced by iron age you know and a bit before a bit after germanic people was probably roughly along those lines they would have 
I can only presume, a attempted to bring about magical effects using ru the runic symbols, the runic characters yeah. that they thought had the appropriate effects. Appropriate yeah, and actually, meaning. I can see that exact same format is used in... Um, I've seen it written in a curse in uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. In uh, I think I've seen, there's some there are definitely Roman examples of that where they've written something like you know cursing this other potter who is there competing for with for <laughs> business or saying to this other person's wife I hate her or whatever and may the gods do this to her. and in runic uh, there's a rune stone that said something like if anyone pushes this over may their family know no luck or something like that so it's mm. it's basically a statement of intent like imposing one's will onto the onto outer reality, yeah. outer reality uh, and uh, by spelling it out. And sometimes modern um, like magic, practitioners of magic will say, you know, the fact that spell, casting a spell is, is the same as spelling something is not coincidental. Um, and also yeah. there's the hermetic tradition where for uh, from the more recently, which is uh, Julius Evelo and others maintain that the medieval Hermetic tradition was an exact continuation of magic from pre-Christian times and is uh, very well preserved in throughout Christianity. Um, they are examples where the Hermetic books have like uh, on the cover, it has a, a, an image of a knight saying, I am virility, he who is not like, who is not a learned and intelligent person, I forbid from opening this book or something like that to prevent mm -hmm. like the, the uninitiated from, from you know, messing with the magic inside. Right, yeah. That's quite so, cool. Yeah, I, I've format. been meaning to read the uh, Hermetic Tradition and Introduction to Magic, yeah. both books of his yeah. that, that I'd quite like to read. I find that topic quite interesting. Yeah, me too. I don't practice magic and I haven't read uh, much on Hermeticism at all, but it sounds interesting and worth worth, uh, worth exploring. Maybe I should get a Hermeticist on uh, on Survive the Jive for a chat about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the idea of not practicing magic makes me think of perhaps what perhaps it, it, it's sidestepping the idea of interpretation of myth. I suppose not. So we have the idea that Sather in Germanic tradition is you know, unmanly. A couple of sources say this. But do we think that... What are, you, what are your thoughts on, on the... I don't want to say that the truth of that, but the... Do you think that the idea that men should never practice Sather is, again, a bit of like a tunnel-visioned reading of one piece of source literature? Or do you think that um, we might be able to see parallels of the idea that men shouldn't do sorcery uh, in other traditions? Well, I think that um, yes and no. In the one sense, we can see in the Germanic sources very contradictory evidence. For example, Egil, who no one accuses of being effeminate in any way, he's a, an Odin, uh, a devotee of Odin, who practices uh, magic and uh, does it very well. But um, so, yeah, and then also the actual mythological story of Odin himself learning Seder from uh, from the Vanir is uh, maybe contradictory, but he does have to then answer to Loki and Loka Sena for his trans his gender transgression in that sense. Mm -hmm. But um, yes and no. So I think that it comes with a price of it's it's not a in it's not it is and I think that should be seen as true and, and the warnings about magic uh, exist carry on in the hermetic tradition in, in medieval times so uh, I don't think it's a, a, an entirely you know uniquely Germanic thing but um, it does seem also I remember uh, it's not exclusively but in other traditions you can see women often practice magic and, and men do too but it's not seen as like something soldiers do as much it's more like an ulterior way and uh, and and the banning of witchcraft after Christianity seems very much focused on the activities of women. So uh, there's it's that normally as well. Women in many traditions, particularly the Germanic tradition, but others I'm sure seem to put forward the idea that women are more responsible for um, foresight. More commonly than men, women have gifts of prophecy um, and of, 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 of you know, any sort of glimpse of the future seems to be, seems to be the case. Yeah. I'll go with that. Yeah, I mean, it. There's. A, I think there's a definite difference between male and female spirituality, and mm. uh, that's an important distinction between in the differences between uh, the the sexes, and um, one should respect and women to have their own 
form of way that's proper to a woman of engaging with divinity, which might seem strange or overly sentimental or devotional to a man. Um, but yeah, it, it's valid for women. But uh, yeah, I think that um, there are, to, to summarize for people who want to practice magic, I don't think it's forbidden for men to do yeah, so. It comes with a price and it's not it's not It comes typical. with a warning, yeah. It comes with warning and it's not typical, it's not manly uh, to do so. So I think that's uh, that's a, a valid uh, aspect of Germanic tradition mm. that I uh, observe. Uh, but maybe yeah, there are say, times when that, it's all right. That makes sense. Times when it's acceptable. <laughs> yeah. When they have it, nothing, no other recourse. <laughs> yeah. If, uh, if uh, yeah, if, if brawn, you know, if muscle won't work, then all right, get your get your mage on. Yeah. Well, I think I've enjoyed this talk, but I think we've we drifted far enough from the uh, the original yes, yeah, topic to, to justify. <laughs> To justify bringing the talk to an end um so i uh, sure thank you very much for joining me redbeard you've been very yeah, thank you yeah. it's uh, been a, it's been good it's been talk. interesting yeah and i hope all your patrons have enjoyed this and um i will from now on i'm going to do more streams um i'm still going to do like the high high uh high input uh high energy what's a high time preference content uh uh as well but I'm going to do two types of streams. One will be public streams for everyone to see, and some will be like this, just for the patrons. And, uh, yeah, you can expect uh, more of the same. And so thanks for watching Survive the Dive. I'll see you next time.